Welcome to the nonprofit webinar on the intersection of employee leave, wage replacement benefits, and health care coverage. Um, my name is Jennifer Przinski. I'm a partner in the Labor and Employment Group, and I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Juliana Reno. Uh, she's a partner in our employee benefits group. Um, both Juliana's practice and my practice consists of a great deal of client counseling. Um, so we spend a lot of time on the phone with our clients, talking them through really particularly thorny issues. And, and one of those particularly thorny issues for our clients is trying to coordinate the leave that an employee is entitled to um, when they go out um, on, on leave and what are the, what's the leave that they're entitled to and what are the wage replacement benefits that they're entitled to. In fact, it's such a thorny issue that uh, Juliana often talk about uh, these very issues offline because it really takes both of our brains to sometimes to get the right answer. So again, my, my area of expertise is addressing the employee leave and Juliana um, really addresses the wage replacement benefits. And together, the two of us are here to explain um, and show you how everything works together. So the next time you're faced with an employee who's gone out on leave for medical or family reasons, it's gonna be hopefully a little easier for you to um, figure out how, how to coordinate those benefits for them. So next slide, please. So here's what we're gonna cover today. Um, First, I'm going to talk about the three categories of employee benefits an employee who's going out for medical or family reasons may be entitled to. And then I'm going to explain in a little more detail the first category um, of those benefits. And then I'm going to turn it over to Juliana. She's going to talk about the benefits in the second and third categories. Um, and then she's going to talk us through some issues that, um, we, that she sees when she's trying to see employees employers walking through those two um, categories. And then we're each going to take a real life example and you'll we're going to wa walk you through step by step on how the coordination of benefits works in, in each example. And hopefully that's going to be really helpful to you. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to walk you through a list of questions that next time you're faced with an employee who's going out on leave for medical or family reasons, you're going to want to ask yourself to ensure that you're coordinating the benefits properly. Um, and then at the end, we've got some time for some questions if we don't cover everything um, that you needed to be answered. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, next slide, please. So if you have an employee who's gonna be absent for their own medical reasons or for a family member's medical reasons or to bond with a new child, there really are potentially three types of employee benefits that the employee may be entitled to. Um, and, and here they are. We've got um, unpaid leave, right? And unpaid leave is usually required by a law, like most of you have heard of, the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, which provides for unpaid leave. Um, but the entitlement also could come from an employer policy from time to time. Employers do have unpaid leave policies, maybe for medical reasons or just for unpaid leave for other reasons. Again, this leave, that first category is unpaid. It's a leave entitlement only. There's no cash payment that goes along with it. Um, so if the employee is going to get any payment during this unpaid leave, it's got to come from another source. And that source is normally the second category, right? It's the wage replacement benefits. Um, and when we say wage replacement benefits, we mean it's only cash money to the employee. There is no leave associated with the cash payment to the employee. Um, Juliana is going to go into more detail on this, but think about like short-term and long-term disability, right? Wage replacement, cash payment only to the employee. And then the third category is a hybrid of the first and second categories. It is leave, but it's paid, right? So paid leave. Um, so it's leave that has a cash payment associ automatically associated with it. You don't have to find that income from another source. Um, well, again, we're going to address this in more detail, but the most obvious example of this hybrid of the unpaid leave and the wage replacement benefits, the paid leave, is you know paid sick leave that there's all those state laws and local laws that say, employer, you have to provide your employee with X amount of paid sick leave, right, for illness or injury reasons. Um, so again, the employee is getting the monetary payment while they're out on this leave of absence due to illness or injury. 
Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Okay, great. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about unpaid leave here. This is the first category of uh, the employee benefits that an employee may be entitled to. Again, it's generally um, sourced by a legal re requirement. So most of you are all probably familiar with the, Fair, the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. I'm gonna refer to it as FMLA during the course of the presentation and so will Juliana. So if you're an employer or a nonprofit who has 50 or more employees in 20 or more work weeks in this calendar year or the previous calendar year and the 20 work weeks don't need to be consecutive, um, you are cover, you're a covered employer under the federal FMLA. And so what that means is you're going to have to give any employee who's eligible for, for FMLA uh, up to 12 weeks of job protected unpaid leave for family and medical reasons. And to be eligible, the employee has to have had worked for you for at least 12 months. And that doesn't need to be consecutive necessarily. It can be non-consecutive. And then they will have to have worked 1,250 hours in the 12 month period prior to the beginning of the leave. And don't forget the last one, which is they have to work at a location um, where the uh, employer employs 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius. Um, so that's federal FMLA. So there might be some of you, uh, you know, listening in today that says, oh, I don't have to worry because we're a smaller employer and we don't have 50 employees. But never fear, um, you still may be covered by state um, family and medical unpaid leave, right? Um, now, there's no real standard across the board the way these laws, these state family and medical unpaid leave laws are written. So you really have to figure it out by jurisdiction. There may be um, differences in how they determine whether you're going to be a covered employer, meaning do you have to have a certain number of employees in the state, or do you have to have a total number of employees across the country? Um, and then there's also different eligibility requirements for the employee you know, assuming you're a covered employer as to whether the employee is going to be entitled um, to this unpaid state uh, leave. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned before, with federal FMLA, family and medical reasons are combined into one big lump, right? It's, it's not separate buckets of medical leave and family leave. Most of the state laws are written like that, but there are other states which actually give separate buckets of medical leave and family leave. So that's another difference with federal that you want to um, look for as well. Um, an example of what I just mentioned is um, DC. I'm going to use that because I am in here in DC today um, and many of my clients are in DC. So so the DC Family and Medical Leave Act covers employers with 20 or more employees in DC, and that law provides 16 weeks of family leave, right, bonding with a new child, caring for a sick family member, um, as well as 16 weeks of medical leave for the employee's own serious health condition, and that's for a 24-month period. So again, that DC FMLA separates um, the buckets of, of leave, and that's a difference from federal. Um, so I so let's go on to um, the, the next slide. Thank you. Um, so what you want to remember, though, what's important when we're talking about this coordination of benefits is just because an employee gets the federal FMLA, they still might be entitled to the state FMLA. You need to make sure that you give them both. Now, that doesn't mean that, let's say, a DC employer who has, you know, 55 employees in DC has to get has to give an employee with a serious health condition, you know, 12 weeks of federal FMLA plus 16 weeks of DC FMLA, so that the leave the total leave of absence goes to 28 weeks. You don't have to do that. What you can do is allow it to run concurrently. So the start date for the federal FMLA and the start date for the DC FMLA starts on the same day and they just basically run in parallel. And that avoids what we call stacking of leave. Now you can allow the employee probably to stack the leave in certain situations, but you probably don't really want your employee out um, 
for a total of 28 weeks straight. So again, stacking is, is usually the, the avenue that most employers choose. So, you know, again, um, now you're thinking, okay, well, you know, Jennifer, we don't, we're not in any state that has, uh, you know, medical or family leave. We don't have to provide unpaid leave. So we don't have to worry about any of this unless we have some policy. Okay, stop right there. You're wrong, unfortunately. We still have to consider the Americans with Disabilities Act. That is the ADA. Um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the courts have made clear a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act is an unpaid leave of absence, right? So if you have an employee with a serious health condition, probably disabled, given the definition of disability is so broad, and they say, hey, I have, I have a need for an unpaid leave of absence, then it's a, you process that as an unpaid leave of absence as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. And okay, there's probably some of you out there that says, you know what, Jennifer, we don't have 15 or more employees, so the federal ADA doesn't apply to us, but don't, but remember, there are always state counterparts for these anti-discrimination laws that prohibit discrimination. They're kind of the catch-all for those smaller employers. So you probably do have obligations under those laws to make sure that you're providing an accommodation um, to, to, those, to those employees. Um, now, I've been talking, all this leave that I've been talking about is, is unpaid, right? But that doesn't mean an employee can't receive pay. So just understand that. We're just trying to distinguish between the, the, the three types that we that we often deal with. Um, so, so the employee doesn't lose income, even though they're on this unpaid leave. We're going to figure out, is there a wage replacement benefit they're, they're entitled to um, during this? Or do they have some other kind of paid leave, maybe in your policy or otherwise that they're entitled to, that they can use during this unpaid leave of absence so they don't lose any money while they're out on, on this leave for family or medical reasons? So now I'm going to turn it over to Juliana to talk to you about the second core, the category of employee benefits. Thanks, Jen. If we could go to the next slide. Great. So um, first, I'm just going to talk about the wage replacement benefits, um, and then we're going to move on to paid leave. So the major divide in the wage replacement benefits, as I have on this slide, is between occupational injury or illness and non-occupational injury or illness. If it is occupational, that's going to be covered by workers' compensation. Workers' compensation is solely a matter of state law, what you're entitled to, um, how long it can last, Typically, uh, workers' compensation will have two elements to it. It'll have the wage replacement, but it will also cover medical benefits. And there will also be um, anti-retaliation provisions like that, things like that. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that um, because employers, other than dealing with first reports of injury, there's a whole system set up for dealing with that. It doesn't usually dovetail with this other stuff that we're talking about. Um what I am going to spend a lot more time on are the non-occupational injury or illness. I will say, though, that these are usually mutually exclusive, right? If you are hurt, you're either going to get, it's either occupational or non-occupational, you're going to get benefits under one system or benefits under another system, but not both at the same time. Okay, so moving on to non-occupational injury or illness, the wage replacement there is Call, usually called short-term disability. Sometimes it's called salary continuation. It can have any number of names. Um, but the idea is that um, you're going to give somebody wages, maybe not 100%, maybe some percentage um, for some period of time. Short-term disability is mandatory in these five states that I've listed here. Um, that can get really complicated. Then there can be employer-provided short-term disability, which can be self-funded or can be fully insured. So, excuse me, fully insured means you literally have an insurance policy that you got from an insurance company that's licensed under state law. Anything else, even if that insurance company is making disability decisions for you on an advice-to-pay system, that's self-funded, okay? So those are the two differences. And the real difference between those is that when somebody asks you, well, you know, does this happen or when does it kick in or what's my waiting period? If, if you have a fully insured short-term disability plan, you have to check the policy. You can't make things up, right? If 
if you have an employer, a self-funded employer plan, it's not that you can make things up, but you have the power to adjust those things unilaterally. You don't have to go to the insurance company and say, hey, can we do this? Or, hey, can we do that? You can just do it. And then you have to deal with fairness and documentation and things like that. But it's not the same as having to run it all past the insurance company. Um, and then there is long-term disability. Now, short, long-term disability, there is no legal distinction. There's no line under the law about when short-term starts and long-term begins. Typically, long-term disability um, is not employer paid. Typically, there's an insurance policy. Um, and typically, it kicks in after um, six months. So I'm going to talk about that in, more in a minute. Um, the, the major things that you need to think about on short-term disability, well, there's some categories that you need to think about. One is who's eligible. So typically someone's eligible if they're a full-time employee. The next thing that happens is that, that there's a waiting period. The waiting period is how long after you become a full-time employee, how long do you have to wait until you're covered by the disability plan? So that will often be, for example, after 60 days of employment. If you are, that means that if you become disabled in the first 60 days, you're not covered. You don't get any benefits. So that's what the waiting period is. The waiting period is you, you meet the eligibility criteria, but you have to wait until you're covered, right? Then now you're covered. Now you become disabled. And the question is, what's the elimination period? The elimination period is... Once you become disabled, how long do you have to wait until your benefits kick in? For short-term disability, it's typically one or seven or 14 days. For long-term disability, as I said, it's typically 180 days. It can be 90 days. It can be anything. It just depends. The, the length, just the major thing that varies is the cost of the insurance policy or the cost of the, of the benefit to the employer. There is no rule that says that short-term disability has to last all the way through the elimination period for long-term disability. That's usually how employers structure things, but not always. And again, there's no rule that requires that. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, now on to paid leave. So we've we've done unpaid leave, we've done wage replacement. Now we're doing paid leave, which remember is both the entitled leave entitlement and the cash. So there's th really three kinds of paid leave that we're going to talk about today. One is the kind that's managed by the state, state managed paid family leave and or paid medical leave. Typically, these are funded through payroll taxes on the employer and and or the employee. So you have to take money out of the pay or you have to contribute money and you send it to the state. And then the claim is submitted to the state and the state decides whether it's approved or not. And then the state makes the payment, right? And the employer's only obligation is to give them job, is to give the employee job protected leave. So typically you can't fire someone uh, while they're on state managed paid family leave or paid medical leave. So the example here, would be uh, DC's Universal Paid Leave Act. So under that act, employees are entitled to eight weeks of parental leave, six weeks of family leave, six weeks of medical leave, and two weeks of prenatal leave, but no more than eight weeks of all of that, except for this, there's this one little caveat that I'm not gonna get into. And all of that's about to change. So soon the overall max is gonna be uh, 12 weeks. Right. So you, there, there's lots of like Jennifer was talking about earlier. There's lots of specific buckets, but you don't get to stack all the buckets. Right. There's buckets and there's an overall cap. The overall cap is going to be 12 weeks, but still you're not ever going to get more than eight weeks of parental leave. OK, so that's the state managed family leave. Then there are state and local mandated paid leave. So you uh, you could be in a state that says you must give this much sick leave, paid sick leave. You must give this much paid family leave. You must, there's uh, there's counties, Montgomery County, for some reason, has this. Lots of cities have this. Um, and it's really hard to keep track of all that. So especially if you're uh, a not-for-profit that has employees in lots of different locations. Uh, the state and local 
mandated paid leave is usually accrued per hour. So one hour of leave accrues for every 30 hours worked. Um, there, it is really varies state by state, the reasons. There's things that you, once you've seen a million of these, you kind of get used to asking the right questions, which are, does it carry over? Is there a cap that uh, maximum accrual or is there a maximum that you can roll over from year to year? When does it start? Do you start accruing the first day that you work? Do you start accruing after 90 days? Um, if it just got put into place, is there any retroactive accrual? Things like that. Lots and lots of variation between the states. It's almost impossible to have a single paid leave policy that works in every state. And the reason is that some states have unlimited accrual, but a limited rollover. Other states have a limited accrual, but unlimited rollover. And so if you try to put the things together, it's everything is unlimited and it's going to cost you a zillion dollars. So that's not really very effective. Um, so that's the state and local paid leave. The last category is employer provided and I have voluntary. That means this is just to distinguish it from the mandates. The employer decides it's going to provide paid leave. It can provide paid time off, which is usually a general category, or it can provide buckets, vacation, sick, parental, et cetera. And obviously, if there's no mandates, right, then all of that employer paid leave, employer provided paid leave, now you're just talking about design issues, right? You don't have to follow a law. You don't have to do a thing. You don't have to do that at all. Just have to have a policy, hopefully a written policy, um, so that it's clear so that you don't end up discriminating against people. All right, next slide, please. So here's where we start to worry about the coordination. Um, typically, the total paid benefits, so Imagine if somebody is disabled, which is this, we're going to be talking about this in much greater detail in the examples. But if somebody's disabled, then they might be entitled to short term disability benefits, and they might also be entitled to, say, paid sick leave. Typically, there are policies and provisions in the insurance policy or provisions in the employer's policy that say the total that you get from all sources cannot exceed your regular pay. Right, that's a really, if your policies don't say that, that would be a really good thing to add. Um, just makes sense. You don't want to motive, you don't want to create uh, incentives for people to claim disability. But, so you don't want it to go above the regular pay, but it is not always the case that you can, what we call top up another benefit. Um, so it's not always true that if you are getting, um, a mandated paid leave. So let's say, uh, let's say you're in a state that requires uh, paid sick leave, and that requirement is 50% of the employee's regular pay. Right? What if the employee wants to get full pay? Can they use their employer-provided paid leave to make up that other 50% difference? And the answer is sometimes. Right? You have to check. So generally, I have two general statements, and then. The caveat. So generally, you cannot top up workers' compensation benefits. Generally, you can top up mandatory paid family leave and mandatory paid sick leave. So that's the example I was just talking about. If you have mandated paid sick leave, usually you can use something else to pay the any gap between the regular pay and what the mandated paid sick leave is. When it comes to short-term disability, there is no generally about it. Um, you just need to check and you need to check the statute or you need to check the employer policy or you need to check the insurance policy depending on which regime you are in. Okay, so each state and each policy has its own rules about what kinds of income will reduce the disability benefit. So for example, um, if you are getting short-term disability and you are also getting social security disability, or you are getting a disability benefit from your retirement plan, those kinds of disability will typically, if you're getting a payment from your retirement plan and a payment from your, and you would be entitled to a short-term disability payment from the short-term disability carrier, often the 
uh, the payment from the retirement plan will shrink the well, the, the payment from the disability carrier will shrink and you will just get the one from your disability plan. Okay, those are called offsets, right? What's what are how are we going to reduce the short-term disability payment? What will reduce the short-term disability payment? Um, and that you just have to see each policy is different. So this is this is where we spend a fair amount of our time because um, it gets really complicated. We can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so we just did benefit coordination. Now we're doing benefit continuation. The thing I need to tell you, just if you hear nothing else, I'm a benefits lawyer, Jennifer is an employment lawyer. Benefits do not necessarily continue during all forms of leave. They just don't. I, many, many, many employers have policies that say, oh, if you go out on a uh, sick leave, we're going to give you, you know, six months of unpaid sick leave. And while you're on sick leave, your benefits will all continue. Well, that's a fine thing to say. I don't want to denigrate and say that's a bad policy. It's not. But you have to check and make sure all your insurance policies say the same thing because you're not in charge of all of that, right? The insurance companies are in charge. And you can usually get whatever you want, but you have to ask for it. Okay, so here's how it usually breaks down. Health benefits typically continue during... FMLA leave and state mandated, mandated leave. Under a lot of, in most cases, if it's unpaid, you have to give the employees the opportunity to drop the coverage because they may not be able to afford it. Um, but if it's paid leave, if they're, then you can often make them stay on it. Okay, so that's health. Medical, and by health, I mean medical dental vision. EAP is an employee assistance program. Those are usually, you know, six free counseling sessions. Um, and then a health flexible spending account. Those are the use it or lose it accounts that people are, are used to having usually typically for um, dental and vision and sometimes for also your uh, deductibles and co-payments you can put into that. So health benefits typically continue during the kind, during FMLA and state mandated leave, but not necessarily other forms of leave. Okay. So for example, if somebody goes on uh, educational leave, right, you're going to give them three months off to go uh, pursue a certification in something. And you just say, okay, we're giving you, excuse me, unpaid discretionary leave and your benefits are going to continue. They may not. They may not. They may not have that written into the insurance. So you need to be careful. And if they don't, for health benefits, you, you would have to put them on COBRA. So disability benefits and life benefits are all over the map. So if you go on family leave, right, you, you give, you're in a state, you're too small to be covered by the FMLA, you're in a state with no mandates, and but there's an employer who gives 12 weeks of paid parental leave. Will your, will your disability carrier and will your life carrier continue to treat those people as eligible? It just depends on the policy. They're all over the map. A lot of times they just say, oh, only FMLA. Again, you can get that changed, but you have to ask. So you have to check the insurance policies. Here's the risk. If you keep covering someone who's not really eligible and there's a problem, the insurance company could deny coverage. Okay, it's also arguably insurance fraud. Frankly, that doesn't get uh, prosecuted very often, it, but it's true. You, it could be. But that's not really the main concern. The main concern is that if you deny coverage, if you make somebody eligible who's not really eligible and the bad thing happens, the insurance company can deny coverage. So for example, let's say your life insurance policy says, if you go on unpaid leave, we'll cover you for 30 days and then we won't. And you tell somebody that they're gonna be covered for their, their life insurance will continue for all 90 days of their unpaid leave and the employee dies after 75 days. The insurance company is gonna deny that coverage. And then the family members are gonna come after you. And that's not a, that that lawsuit is, is um, it's not a slam dunk in any case, uh, but but it will cost you a lot in terms of figuring it all out. Right. So let's just be let's just be really careful about that. 
um, and know your know your rules. So I have a lot of employers that say, well, what are we supposed to do? How do we know which ones continue? You make a chart. You make a chart with all the different kinds of leave and all your different policies. And then you look at your you look at your policy, you look at your insurance policies and you just make a chart so you know. It's about that, it's about that. Um, last thing I just want to say, most people miss this one. Dependent care flexible spending accounts, right? The, the accounts that you can use to pay dependent care expenses. Typically, if somebody is home, those expenses have to be to enable the employee to work. So if the employee is home on sick leave, they typically cannot be used to pay dependent care expenses if the sick leave continues beyond two weeks. Okay, one more slide, please. Okay, so major medical coverage in particular and benefit continuation. So here's what happens. Typically, these will say an employee is eligible if they are regularly scheduled to work at least 30 hours per week. That's the rule from the Affordable Care Act. Okay, if they're no longer regularly, when do they stop being no longer regularly scheduled? This is an issue and we'll address it a bit in the section when somebody goes on disability, right? At what point they go on short-term disability? Obviously they're not scheduled to work. At some point they drift onto long-term disability. At what point do we say they're no longer eligible because they're no longer regularly scheduled? Um, that is something that is tricky and every employer has to decide for itself. My, I will say this, it is very hard to argue that if somebody is on long-term disability, that they're regularly scheduled to work. Why does it matter? Because if they're no longer eligible, they need to be offered COBRA, right? Federal COBRA or state mini COBRA. So if you have someone who is on long-term disability and they're still being covered as an active employee under your medical plan, that's a risk. Is it the worst thing in the universe? No, but it is a risk. Okay. Um, I will say one last thing before handing it back to Jen, which is under the, under the Affordable Care Act, employers can use the look back method. So what happens is you, you can make it here in my example, it says, uh, uh, the your coverage often says an employee is eligible if they're regularly scheduled to work at least 30 hours per week. Since the Affordable Care Act, it will also say, or are full-time as defined by the Affordable Care Act. So typically, even if someone is no longer regularly working, if the employer uses the look-back method to determine eligibility under their major medical coverage, which they don't all do, but if you do that, then even if somebody hasn't been working, they can stay covered. Um, and that gets that gets really tricky. Not everybody uses, you can't just assume, you can't just say, well, under the look back method, they if I do that, then I can make them eligible. If you're not doing the look back method, that's not gonna work, right? And frankly, a lot of people, even though they use the look back method for affordable care act reporting, they're not using it for eligibility, right? They're saying everybody who's in our system is full-time is eligible. And then they worry about the affordable care act separately. So a lot going on there, I know. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions. But for now, I'm going to pass uh, pass the baton to Jen. OK, next slide, please. All right, now we get to the fun stuff. We're going to walk through some, scenar uh, some scenarios. I'm going to take the first one. Um, here is our scenario. I'm going to talk slowly in case you, I'm going to run through the entire, the employee benefit entitlements first, and then I'm going to flip to another slide where we actually map out for you how the benefits are coordinated together. So here's the scenario. We have a nonprofit with 75 employees in DC. They have an employee who gives birth by regular delivery, and the employee wants to take 16 weeks off after the birth to bond with a new child. Okay, so this is what the employee is going to be entitled to. So because we've got 70, 50 or more employees, the employee is entitled to 12 weeks of federal FMLA because the employees work for the nonprofit for 12 months and has the 1250 service hours. Um, and, and again, this is a combination of family and medical leave in one bucket for the 12 weeks, there's no distinction. It's family, 12 weeks of family and medical leave combined. Second, 
the employee is going to be entitled to 16 weeks of leave under DC FMLA. The employee meets the eligibility requirements, assume that the 12 months, as well as the 1,000 hours uh, service requirement. Now, remember, DC FMLA does make the distinction. So the available entitlements under DC FMLA, and for purposes of the scenario, I'm assuming that the employee hasn't used either federal or DC FMLA at all um, pr prior to this, this leave. So the, the entitlement that is, are available is 16 weeks of medical leave under DC FMLA, as well as 16 weeks of family leave, and that's in that 24-month period. The nonprofit also has a fully insured, as Juliana said, that's when you go out and you get an insurance carrier to provide your employees with short-term disability. Um, the short-term disability policy provides for up to 26 weeks of benefits for those employees who are covered, and it pays 100% of the employee's salary during the short-term disability period. Um, the policy provides that the employee who has a regular delivery gets six weeks of short-term disability benefits and eight weeks for a cesarean. And that's pretty much standard across the board. Um, usually, it's, again, check, check your policies, but, but that's usually standard, six weeks and the eight weeks for a C-section. The nonprofit also has a paid parental leave policy that says the employee all employees get eight weeks of paid parental leave. And that parental leave policy is both for the birth parent as well as the non-birthing parent. The employee is also eligible for eight weeks of DC paid family leave under the Universal Paid Leave Act, right? And, and again, as Juliana had said in the example, this is a state managed Benefit. So the employee applies for DC paid family leave with the off DC Office of Paid Family Leave. They're the ones that approve the benefits. They're the one that makes the cash payment to the employees. And all we do as the employer is just give the corresponding unpaid leave. It's that hybrid example. Um, the employee also has a paid time off balance of four weeks that's available to them. Now, I know some of you are thinking, oh, Jennifer, you missed the DC paid sick leave. No, we're going to assume that the PTO policy that this nonprofit has is compliant with the DC accrued safe and sick leave act. So you can assume that any paid sick leave entitlements that they're entitled to under, under DC law are absorbed under that PTO policy. So those are all the entitlements. Now, how does this all work together? Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so what we went ahead and what, what we did for purposes of this is putting together a chart. So I'm gonna go through each of the three categories of employee benefits, and then you can see through this chart how they all work together. So let's start with the unpaid leave. And again, I'm assuming no prior federal or DC FMLA use for purposes of the scenario. So if you look at the third column here, it's unpaid leave under federal FMLA. The employee gives, and we're assuming here that the employee gives birth on August 6th. So you'll see they get the 12 weeks of D, uh, federal FMLA. And again, it's combined. There's no distinction between the two. Uh, if you take a look at the second column here, uh, yes, the second column here, you'll see that the employee is going to get six weeks of DC FMLA for medical leave. Now, Julia and I, and I have talked about this extensively. The regs don't really address it, but the employee is disabled for purposes of short-term disability. So that's why we're assigning during the short-term disability period, we're assigning it to an employee's medical leave as opposed to the family leave. But after the six weeks, right, that they're considered disabled under the short-term disability policy, you can see on weeks set on let's see there on September 19th, it's gonna switch over to DC FMLA family leave for the remainder, right? So that's the bonding leave. So what that means then is after this leave is all over and concluded, um, the federal FMLA is gonna be exhausted, but they are still going to have six, 10 weeks 
of medical leave under DCFMLA and six weeks of family leave left over for the applicable 24 month period. So that is the unpaid leave. Let's go to the fourth column and we're gonna talk about the wage replacement. Again, no leave, but it's just the cash payment. So this is, as per the policy, the um, employee is going to, is it a regular delivery? So they're gonna get six weeks of short-term disability benefits um, at 100% of their salary. Um, there is a, I mean, in this scenario, you could have, you, you could have a seven day elimination period. Um, so the benefits really wouldn't start until week one, but then we're gonna go on to DC paid family leave during the um, elimination period. Um, so again, essentially under that short-term disability policy, the waiting period they could use potentially PTO if, if it, or they could just keep it a DC paid family leave or they could use the parental leave if they wanna cover cover that because there is no payment under short-term disability. So they're really only getting paid for weeks two through six there. Um, so let's go to the fifth column and you'll see that the uh, employee is going to get the eight weeks of the nonprofit provided parental leave. So the short-term disability policy, as I said, provides 100% of the employee's salary during the short the, during that period, right? That they're receiving short-term disability benefits. So there's no need to gross up. I know there are, and Julia, I was gonna talk about it in a little bit, but there are those short-term disability policies that provide for 60 or 80%. And then that's a different, that's a different term, permutation here of the scenario. But for purposes here, we're just starting that paid leave, paid parental leave on the week of September 19th because the employee is receiving short-term disability benefits during that time. And again, we don't want employees to receive more than, than their salary. Um, so in the sixth column then, we're going to um, look at the entitlement of DC paid family leave. Again, that's a state managed benefit. The employee under um, paid family leave is going to get a maximum benefit now. It's a thousand dollar, a thousand nine dollars per week. Um, and remember, the nonprofit is just providing unpaid leave. DC government pays, um, and they're the ones that sent, that are sending the employee money. I did see a question here in um, in, in the panel um, about the offset. So there, so this is through a carrier right? This short-term disability policy is self-insured. It's coming through a carrier. DC did pass a law that says the carrier can't offset for short-term disability benefits while the employee is receiving the paid family leave. You are able to do it if it's the salary continuation um, fully self-funded. As Juliana had mentioned, you are allowed to do the offset, but, but that might be why your short-term disability carrier didn't offset the payment that the employee was receiving from for DC paid family leave. And then finally, in the last two rows here, you'll see, um, and these are rows, not columns, you'll see that the parental leave has been exhausted, right? So now they're going to use two weeks of their PTO to, so they don't lose any income during that full 16 week um, period. And so, Again, if it gets a little, so that's the most complicated scenario when it's the employee who's giving birth. Now, if it's if it's an an employee who hasn't given birth, right, a non-birthing parent, essentially they would get the benefits um, beginning on September 18th through the end, right? Because they're not disabled, they're not going to get any short-term disability benefits, they're not going to get any DC um, medical leave, DC FMLA medical leave. Um, so they would just, they would get that and you would just push the um, FMLA down a little further. Actually, you know um, what, and then, you know what yeah. though, I, I think that they would get, they could get parental leave right at the beginning if they wanted it. Correct. During the elimination, during the elimination period, if they wanted to, you could move that up or if they wanted to gross up the DC paid family leave. Yes, they could move that up or they could use the extra week of um, PTO that they have in their balance because they're only using two weeks at the end. So they could use PTO up at the beginning as well. Um, totally agree. Um, and then also remember, this is just from the date of birth, right? August 6th. But if there are um, complications related to the pregnancy that the employee can't 
work and needs unpaid leave, this all gets pushed back and starts up at the beginning. Um, you know, it starts before the sixth then. Um, that, again, another permutation, but um, hopefully this is giving you enough ideas. So I am going to, Juliana, if you want to add any more to this scenario, or um, I'll turn it over to you to um, address your, your second scenario. I will. And thank you for the reminder to ask this question, because I was supposed to give the CLE code. It was in my notes and everything, and I just spaced it out. So the CLE code is benefits with an S, 2022. Benefits 2022. Thanks again for the reminder. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is an employee in Nebraska who is totally disabled. I've picked Nebraska because I practiced there for 25 years and I know that there are no mandates. Um, I was afraid to pick anywhere else. So uh, what first we first we figure out what the employee is entitled to. There they have uh I'm assuming a large employer here. So a federal FMLA, 12 weeks of family medical leave combined. Uh, they, there is short-term disability available, 26 weeks at 60%, up to 26 weeks at 60%. There's employer-provided paid medical leave. So six weeks and employer-provided vacation, four weeks. Okay, next slide. I'm going to do this kind of quick so we have room for the questions at the end, because this one's much simpler, right? So <clears throat> you've got unpaid FMLA leave for 12 weeks. That means they're job protected for at least 12 weeks. You've got them getting short-term disability, right? They're getting short-term disability for 16 weeks. We're assuming for the sake of this that the employee is disabled for 16 weeks. Okay, so they get they get sixty percent under the S, the short term disability plan. They get sixty percent of their wages. They also have paid leave from the employer, medical leave, vacation leave. So they can, if the depending on how the policies are written, right? They may be able to use the paid leave to top off their wage replacement. So for the extra 40%, they may be able to use the medical leave. They may be able to use the vacation leave. Okay, now what do I mean by may? This is something that we talked about earlier, right? It may because you need to see what the employer policy says and you need to see what the short-term disability policy says, right? You generally can't get more than 100% of pay. I assume it's, it would probably say that somewhere in both of those. Um, but it also might be that the short-term disability policy says, uh, if you have medical paid medical leave, that your benefits are reduced dollar for dollar for dollar for any medical leave that you use. It may say the same thing for vacation leave, not usually, but it might, right? So it will just depend. So that just reminding you about that coordination issue. The last two more things I want to point out about this, those last four weeks that are highlighted in blue, those are not job protected, right? So you are not required to keep to to keep employing this person. Now, sure, is it a good idea to terminate somebody who's disabled? You're going to have an ADA issue. It's a little scary to do that. Um, it, it's not that it can't be done, but you would at least have to think about: Is this person going to be entitled to an ADA accommodation? So you at least need to think through the ADA issues. Um, and even it's just, it's difficult, bad optics, bad risk. So I would say most employers would not terminate this person, especially if they knew it was only 16 weeks, but it's not required, right? You don't, not required to keep them on. It's just a risk if you don't. Last thing I want to note about this example is let's just say for the sake of argument that you terminated this employee on November 14th, when they were no longer on job protected leave. That may or may not cut off their short-term disability benefits. If it's fully insured, it probably will not. If the short-term disability benefit is fully insured, it probably will not. Short-term, I mean, the insured benefits typically vest. They lock in. If you are covered on the date of disability, you don't still have to be employed. And that's true for long-term disability as well. Now, if, it, if it's a self-funded short-term disability plan, a lot of employer plans say, 
we're going to pay you short-term disability, but only as long as you're our employee. So that just depends, right? The, again, the issue is, is termination going to cut off your disability benefits? The answer is usually no. If it's a fully insured benefit, it's a, it depends if it's an employer benefit. Um, and I'm going to bounce it back to Jen. I think we've got about 10 minutes left and we've got a bunch of questions backing up. So, yep. Um, so here we have put together for you and I'll run through them quickly. Just a list of questions that you're going to want to ask yourself when you're trying to figure out these coordination of benefits issues. So the reason the employee needs leave, is it medical? Is it occupational or is it non-occupational? Is it family leave or is it neither? Um, is there a legally mandated unpaid leave that they're entitled to? Is there a legally mandated paid leave that, that's available to them? Um, does Do you have short-term or long-term disability policies? Um, is it fully insured? Is it self-funded? Um, what other types of non-mandated employer-provided leave are there? You've got PTO, do you have parental leave, vacation, sick, annual leave, right? And then when will the employee lose eligibility for all of these benefits? Again, the, you know, what Juliana was saying, you know, hear, hear her say when she says, look to see, you know, when an employee loses coverage under your benefit plans, because you it, it really is governed by the terms of your plans. You can't just arbitrarily say, oh, we're going to continue. You got to look at the plan. It's something that I see um, is a really particularly tricky area for a lot of um, clients. So definitely focus on that. Um, and and so the and so I think I'm going to turn to the next slide because I know we're running out of time. Thanks. And so a few random thoughts, and I think I'm going to answer a couple of the questions here on the policy. So somebody asked in the questions, how can an employee choose to take their federal FMLA and then stack the state FMLA leave? Typically under the state policy, you're allowed to have it run concurrently. In fact, I'm not aware of anyone that you can't have it run concurrently. So just put it in your policy. Say you can't choose employee, they run concurrently. An employee doesn't have the option normally of, of electing to stack their leave. So just put it in, in your policies there. Um, and and when you come to that state managed disability benefit um, and you provide parental leave, a lot of times we put in the policy for parental leave, hey, by the way, in order to get the paid parental leave, you better be applying for those, those state um, managed disability benefits. Again, so it, uh, it allows for this kind of double dipping um, and, and stacking. Um, and then also in your policies, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, specify which ones um, continue during the leaves and when they're going to end. I mean, we talked about it with what Juliana said with regard to the policies themselves and look at the policy terms. But what I also see a lot is, is most handbooks and policies don't address what happens to the employer provided paid time off while employees are out on absences. So does it continue to, does vacation continue to accrue indefinitely if an employee's out for, you know, 16 weeks? Um, that's something an employer normally doesn't think about until the situation, you know, arises. So think about that now and specify. And if you're going to have a policy that says, okay, you know, after a continuous 30-day absence, the benefits stop accruing, the employer provided benefits stop accruing, that's fine. You have to do it for all, I would recommend doing it for all absences. You can't do it just for FMLA because that would be an issue under the FMLA or, or DC FMLA. Um, and then finally, you can consider um, adopting a leave to term policy. So, so basically what this is, is you definitely always want to take into account applicable law, but it's a policy that's in place that says, you know, you're going to be, you know, employed until one of these things happen. So it, you're going to be, continue to be employed until you resign from the company. Um, until you start being employed somewhere else, right? We're going to fire you if you accept a job with another employer. Um, 30 days after you've been released to come back to work, and we don't have any other medical, you know, documentation that provides for your continued absence, even though we've tried. And again, this is all subject to laws um, and, and back and forth in the interactive process, but they don't come back within a 30 day period. You can have them, you know, terminate, um, be ter automatically terminated. Um, and then immediately um, a, a failure to return if you have an approved 
personal leave of absence that you've approved, right? So let's say an employee needs time off for I don't know, some sabbatical reason, nothing related to family or medical reasons, just for personal reasons. And you say, okay, we're going to give you a month off. You need to return. And then they just don't return at all. And they don't give you any explanation if you can terminate them. And then finally, you can have, a, um, you could terminate after 12 months absence in an 18 month period. And again, this is Juliana's policy. So this is where we go back and forth a little bit. So we need to remember the ADA before we terminate. So talk to your counsel before applying that specifically. So um, I'm gonna, I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions. Um, again, the CLE passcode is benefits with an S2022. Um, and now we will go ahead over to questions. Juliana, I don't know if you have. I can, I can uh, take, I can take one and you can pick one next and we'll just bounce back and forth. Perfect. It? Okay. So we just got a question about whether an employee can waive the company's paid maternity leave and opt for federal FMLA, which provides more weeks. Okay. There's not that, uh, the question doesn't make sense. And here's why, because they're different categories right? One is paid maternity leave and F federal FMLA is unpaid leave. So typically, typically the employee, the employer can designate the, the leave as federal FMLA leave, okay? The employee can take the federal FMLA leave. You can't stop them from taking that, right? They, they get a certain number of weeks under FMLA. Um, and what you do control, though, is what are the conditions under which they can get paid maternity leave? You can make it run concurrently with FMLA. And that's what normally uh, that's what we normally see. Right. So it, it, it isn't an e it doesn't there's not an either or. Right. You, you should definitely should not write a policy that says you only get maternity leave if you waive your FMLA. So don't do that. Um, it's not an either. I think that the bottom line is it's not an either or. These should probably be structured so that they can um, run concurrently. Jen? Uh, yeah. So um, I'm going to take this one question um, because I, I find it, I, I talk about it a lot with several clients. It says if you're a multi state employer, how do you keep all these, keep equity amongst employees in different states who have different entitlements? Um, you, you know, there are going to be, when it comes to state managed benefits, there's, you, you can't provide equity there really, unless you're just going to pay out of pocket for some, for some gross up amount. Um, typically what you can do is we recommend looking at all the state entitlements um, and seeing what you know, policy, is there something across the board that makes sense to, that you want to provide to all of your employees um, and, and trying to go that way? It's, it's probably, it's better from an employee relations perspective and, and less cumbersome than trying to have separate state supplement, handbook supplements for your employees in different states, because it does get a little difficult to, um, you know, to make sure to administer and manage. So if you just have one policy that's as generous as all the other, you know, the state provided policies and you provide it to all employees, regardless of the location, then there's equity across and then they get kind of that off, and then you can do the offset, hopefully, um, with the state managed provided disability benefits because it's coming out of your pocket. I, again, like I said, with the DC law that says and carriers can't offset, but employers can, but we really don't have, have a dog in that fight. I mean, that's between the carrier and, and the um, employee. It's, it's not coming out of our pocket. So I think we are one minute <laughs> over time, um, but thank you very much for um, taking the time to listen to us today. And uh, we hope that um, this has been helpful to everyone.